brothers and sisters, my name is, as I was introduced, is Bishop Beckstead. I've been Jason's bishop for the last few years, and, and really Sarah's adopted bishop. She had two. I was Bishop B. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. We'd like to start, the couple has, has asked Casey Turnbaugh, who is a longtime friend of Jason's, to offer beginning prayer. So we'll start with that. For the ring ceremony, what we'll do, what we're asking as bishops is to teach briefly a little bit about marriage and the importance of that. And then I'll have some advice for this couple. I'm talking to you mostly. Everybody just gets to be here. And then following that, I'm going to talk just a little bit about this couple and how great a people they are. And then we'll do the exchange of rings, okay? So again, brothers and sisters, let me welcome you all here. This couple chose to have a ring ceremony for a specific reason, because they had many people in their lives that are important to them that they wanted to share this sacred experience with, the, the opportunity to exchange rings. Um, earlier today, um, Jason and Sarah were married in the Denver Temple and sealed for time and all eternity. But I want to pay tribute to every person that's here today for this ring ceremony. You're here because in some way, each of you have meant something important to this couple. Your love, your examples, your prayers, and sometimes your tears. But your impact has changed their lives, and that's why they've gathered here. So as I said earlier today, they, they were sealed in the temple. Sorry, I wasn't able to be there with you today. Um, in the temple, it is the house of the Lord. And it's a place where the most sacred covenants are made between man and God. And in its place, it's a place that we hold the most sacred. In marriage, we make vows to each other. But these vows are for the period of our mortal lives. In the temple, however, we make covenants. This covenant is between the husband and the wife and the Lord. This covenant makes the Lord a literal partner in our marriages, provided that we remain faithful to each other and to Him. Of the covenants that we make in the temple, of all those covenants, the marriage covenant is the most sacred. The family is ordained of God. What you're beginning here today is essential for his eternal plan. The Apostle Paul taught in 1 Corinthians that neither is the man without the woman, neither is the woman without the man in the Lord. The significance of your marriage together is that you can become even more complete than when you were apart. However, to become as complete and ready to grow in all the ways the Heavenly Father intends, it requires you including him in your marriage, and that's the significance of Paul's teaching. Marriage between man and woman has been the foundational plan, part of the Heavenly Father's plan since the very beginning. In Genesis 2.18, God taught Adam that it is not good that man should be alone, and Eve became his companion. One of the very first instructions that was given to any of God's children was again to Adam and Eve in the garden when he said, and this is from Genesis 2.24, and God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the flesh, oh, excuse me, over the fish of the sea and of the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And then he included this charge. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now this commandment was given to teach us and to establish that a husband and wife and their children are the building block, the foundation for this world that Heavenly Father has ordained. And that first instruction given to Adam and Eve in the garden is still in force today. In the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord teaches us and impresses upon us the importance of the marriage partnership and of caring for one another in this partnership when he said, Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto her and none else. Now, his counsel from that scripture simply teaches us this. A spouse is the only person other than the Lord whom we have been commanded to love with all of our heart. The phrase none else teaches that nothing else, no person, no job, no activity, should get in front of or interfere with or take precedence over the marriage relationship. And I think the two of you are that very, very well. Those who are married should consider their union as their most sacred and cherished earthly relationship. The First Presidency of the Church said this in the Proclamation of the Family. We, the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, solemnly proclaim that marriage
marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God, and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. Husband and wife have a solemn responsibility to love and care for each other and their children. Children are an heritage of the Lord. That's from Psalms. Parents have a sacred duty to rear their children in love and righteousness, to provide for their physical and spiritual needs, to teach them to love and to serve one another, to observe the commandments of God, and to be law-abiding citizens wherever they live. Husbands and wives, mothers and fathers will be held accountable before God for the discharge of these obligations. Now, one of the greatest blessings of being a bishop in a young single adult ward is the interviews that I get to do to find out incredibly and sometimes really funny things um, about these great young people as they get married. Some of this I captured in, I wrote them down in their very words as I asked them a few questions that I wanted to share with each of you today. Because the way that they phrased some of their responses was really touching. I asked them each to tell me about their first date. They remembered it almost word for word identically, which is kind of unique, to be honest. I think I'm on my 150th wedding, and there's always a funny difference between those two. They said they had met at several YSA events over time, but it wasn't until a shotgun shooting event. Now, I think Sarah packs heat, too, so. <laughs> they, there was a shotgun shooting event that they had both posted on Facebook that they would, that they would be attending. That gave Jason the courage to reach out to her through Facebook and send a friend request. Sarah checked with her friends to find out who might know Jason to make sure he was okay. <laughs> and I think that's very wise, by the way, to see if he was a good guy. One friend in particular, Jason Aldridge, said in fact that he was a really good guy. And you know what? He was right. So Sarah went ahead and friended him. This is a different world than I lived in. <laughs> and they ended up on a first date, which was shopping for guns. <laughs> I asked them to share with, with you some words about their first kiss. This is a romantic story. It begins with Jason's foot surgery. <laughs> Sarah had volunteered to come over and hang out with him and take care of him and to help him after his surgery. Both had decided that they really wanted to kiss each other that night, independent of one another. They hadn't talked about it. But both of them, ironically, worried that they didn't want Jason's pain medication to be the reason. <laughs> Sarah said she wanted it to count and know that he was on sound line. <laughs> Jason said later that he found out that Sarah had decided that it was going to be, that night was going to be in quotes, the kiss or be friended. <laughs> Sarah said that night was her last first kiss. Mm -hmm. I asked each of them what they most admired about each other. This was Sarah's response in her own words. I love how loving he is and the light that he brings to everything. His zest for life makes every day an adventure. His attitude makes trials only the easier. He is a worthy priesthood holder who follows Christ and strives to be a better person. That is just incredible. Jason said of Sarah, again in his words, her smile, her understanding, and testimony of the, of the atonement, her love for everyone, her compassion, her desire to help others through service, which we've seen in both of you. Her willingness to stay in when I don't feel good, and her willingness to hike a 14er when I do feel good. <laughs> and he also loves your googly-eyed face when you talk about the two of you together. <laughs> and later on, I would encourage you to show that googly-eyed face to your audience. Here. Last question. I ask them for something that makes them laugh about each other. Jason's response first this time. Her driving. <laughs> he said once they were on the date and her driving made him really car sick. So when he finally got up the courage to talk to her about it, she said, oh, my dad says the same thing. <laughs> and now he drives most of the time, smiling face. Sarah said, when he's happy, 
or is about to do something mischievous, his eyes get this look, and you can show that to him too. <laughs> and he gets this grin, and it always makes me laugh. But he usually starts laughing too. She said also, I love about him what makes me laugh is that his grumpy days are hilarious. <laughs> because when he thinks he is grumpy, it's actually really funny. <laughs> That's a good foundation to build on. <laughs> Let me read this quote from President Gordon B. Hinckley about marriage. I think it sums a lot up. He said the most important, this is quote, the most important decision of life is the decision what's in your mind. And when you're married, be fiercely loyal to one, to one another. Selfishness is the great destroyer of a happy family. I have this one suggestion to offer. If you will make your, your first concern the comfort, well-being, and the happiness of your family, sublimating any personal concern to that loftier goal, you will be happy, and your marriage will go through eternity. I'm not as smart as him. So my advice is a simple formula. I think happiness in marriage equals hard work, plus patience, plus forgiveness. Learn to be Christ-like in all of your forgiving, which I, a quality I really admire in both of you. Pay attention to the little things every day, and they'll prevent a lot of big things. Happiness is not in looking for perfection or comparing each other to anyone else. It's loving each other for who you are. Happiness is helped along by remembering to say, I love you every single day, and hopefully mean it. Serving each other with joy, not just because you feel duty bound to do that. Look to those great examples that both of you have in your lives with important people in your life, such as your parents and others, and follow the power of their righteous examples. Marriage is a union of people with neither exercising dominion over the other. Only cooperation, persuasion, love, encouragement, and comfort by the Father. And then finally, to be unified in all of the decisions. Now, are you ready to exchange rings? The symbolism of the wedding ring is in the purity and the precious nature that they're, of the metals that they're always made out of, as well as the roundness, which is without beginning or end. Except represents the eternal nature of this following with God and your ability to be with our families in Him forever. Jason, would you take your bride by the right hand and place your ring upon her finger? Sarah, would you take Jason by the hand and place your ring upon his finger? And now, again, you may kiss as husband and wife. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I present to you Mr. and Mrs. Jason Winter.